Hi, I'm Jay Davenport, Vice President of Development and Alumni Relations. And on today's episode of VCU Voices, my guest is our Athletic Director, Ed McLaughlin. Ed has been with VCU for nine years, and during that time, VCU Athletics has completed or obtained 33 A-10 championships and has been to 56 NCAA appearances during those nine years. Ed, thanks so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. So I want to start today um, just to reflect on how the team is doing after the end of this year's NCAA tournament. Quite a remarkable end to the season. And can you just give us an update now that a little time has passed? How is the team doing and how are the coaches doing? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's uh, everyone's recovered in, in a lot of ways from, from a health perspective, certainly those who are uh, those individuals who who were uh, contracted COVID are are doing better and uh, they're doing fine and, and out of uh, out of isolation now, so that's good. Um, but you know, overall, I think our team's just really kind of focused on two things. Number one, uh, appreciating the year that we had, and uh, and then number two, looking forward to the future and, and what could be a very very bright future for us as we go forward. So. You know, it, it, it's it's uh, it's strange. I think we're the only team in America that had uh, had COVID shut us down two years in a row to end our season. Um, you know, having having our season ended a few hours before we were supposed to play in the NCAA tournament this year, and then having uh, having our season ended minutes a uh, minute before we were supposed to play the A10 championships last year. Um, so it, it was. It's been a, a bizarre last uh, last game or, or last day for our season the last two years, but uh, but you know we're just focused on on uh, staying healthy and, and making sure everyone can continue to do the work this spring to get ready for next year. That's great news. Great team this year, and um, exciting to see the women uh, do really well in the tournament as well. Yeah, I was really um, super happy for for our women's team. First time we've. First time we've won a conference championship in women's basketball, and and uh, and it's only second time in our school history that we've been in the NCAA tournament, and second time in in our school history that we've had both men and women in the NCAAs at the same time as well. So, quite a remarkable year, and 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 really, Jay, um, more than anything, happy for our seniors in that team, uh, Madison and Olga and Sophie and, and Taya, who's a, a local kid here from uh, from Huguenot High School. Um, they, you know, they just to, to come so close the last two years and in, in, right. uh, in, in losing in a championship game two years beforehand and then being able to finally break through at home uh, to do it as well um, was, was certainly a, a very, very special moment. I wish we could have had more fans uh, in the stands for it, which I know if, if it was a regular uh, a, a non COVID game, a regular day, we would have had a ton of fans, but um but it was great and really happy, like I said, for for all the the, the student athletes, but mostly the seniors. I mean, they, they've they've been through the ringer uh, with this group, so it's uh, it was nice to see them have that success at the end. Absolutely. So that's one of the things I want you to talk a little bit about. Is uh, I think it was probably most visible with the basketball teams because we're so used to such large crowds and those that were able to attend games this year. We had about two hundred and fifty people in the stands. But talk about the other sports as well, because every team was affected by the absence of spectators and just a completely different environment this year. So what did we learn uh, from this experience and what are some of your takeaways? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the one thing we learned is that uh, the Seagull Center gets is pretty quiet. And when there isn't, <laughs> we don't have 8,000 people in the stands, that's probably the one thing we learned uh, right off the bat. I mean, it, it was it was very weird watching games um, in that environment. It felt like we were watching practice in a lot of ways or, or in, uh, an inter squad scrimmage. So, um, you know, it, it's, you, you kind of, you, you, you find out pretty quickly how much you miss the, the crowd energy and, and having people there and, and just seeing familiar faces interacting and um, all the, the, the way that our teams mean um, something important to this community. Um, not only just our campus community, but the, the Central Virginia community. And it, it's, um, you know, it, it's been hard on, on the other teams as well. I mean, you know, all of our teams are playing right now other than the basketballs. And, and we are just, we're, we're going flat out with 
sometimes we've had, you know, four or five games in a day on Saturday, this past Saturday, we had three games going on at the same time in different locations. We had, uh, it was, it, it, we had a busy day to say the least, but you know, our, our student athletes certainly miss it, you know, and, and uh, they miss having uh, fans at their games and, you know, we can have limited numbers obviously right now, but, um, but just, just the energy that, that, that the kids get from playing in front of people, it's that it's been different. It, it's been really, really different. Um, and it's something that, that, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to never having to deal with this ever again. I think that's the, uh, the big takeaway from this year. Um, never again, let's, um, let's beat COVID and then not worry about another pandemic for the rest of our careers. So. Yeah, that, that would be nice. Right. I mean, it's one of those things where I, I tell people all the time we are in the, we're like the 15th month of 2020 right now. And uh, you know, it's 2020 needs to stop. We need to turn the page and get to 2021 eventually. So um, we, we, we should all hope to never have to deal with a pandemic again uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. So one of the things that people are always fascinated by is how individuals arrive at the spot um, at the university leadership and the administration. So why don't you share with folks your journey, your career journey from starting out in collegiate athletics and then how you ended up as a as an athletic director. You've had a, a storied career and you're one of the respected ADs around the country. Um, so, you know, some people refer to um, your peers as kind of the deans of the athletic directors, people who've been doing this for a long time. But talk about that career journey. Yeah, no, I, I mean, storied or notorious is probably, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure which is more, more, more applicable. But, uh, you know, I, I really, um, I, I got into college athletics more so than in, in college because I, I you know, I, I had, uh, I needed something to do with my time. Um, when I was in college, I, I, I wanted to be a, 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 a journalist and, um, really my, my, my dream at that point, you know, early in college was to be the beat writer for the Boston Red Sox. That was like, in my mind, that was going to be the, the greatest job I could ever have. And looking back, um, I'm, I'm certainly happy I'm not in the newspaper business. I can tell you that right now, but you know, I, I, I so I started doing some work in, in college, um, in, in, in athletic communications and, and that just sort of became a, a platform for me for my first jobs, which were, um, uh, in internship in communications in at Merrimack College in uh, which is a now a Division One school, but at that point was Division Two, just north of uh, just north of Boston, and uh, and also as a as a communications intern for Hockey East, which is the conference that Merrimack played in as well. So, um, and I also at that point too, I was I was uh, a high school sports writer for a local newspaper. Oh wow. I had a bunch of jobs going on at the same time, like we all do. And you're getting you're just getting out, and you're making no money, and you're just scra scraping it together uh, every day. But I realized pretty quickly in in my my year covering high school sports that you have to be a really really good writer to be smart and impactful every single day. Um, and 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 what I didn't have in in the journalism world, which I have in college athletics, is that like that the competitiveness, the sense of team, the I, I, I kind of realized quickly like being part of the story was much better than reporting on the story and much more fulfilling. Uh, and I saw just the, the impact that that college athletics had on the lives of student athletes. And, you know, I had a, all my friends and roommates and, and uh, back in the day um, in, in college, I mean, we all participated, but, you know, I mean, my, my friends were all student athletes. So I, I really needed something to do um, and which is how I got into it. Right. So, um, so, you know, if, at, once I was at Merrimack, I, I became a uh, an assistant AD at Merrimack. After a few years, I was there for five years. Um, I, I transitioned from communications into facilities and operations. But at, in the Division two school, as you know, I mean, like you're in a small school, you do it all. I mean, I was, you know, I was the guy. I was the guy who opened the the, the hockey rink in the morning on the weekends and opened the concession stand. I drove the Zamboni. I bartended at at. Uh, at hospitality events after games, I did all, I, you, know, you just do it all. I was the equipment guy. I was the intramural guy because we, you know, you just didn't, you didn't have people to do it. You, know, you just did it all yourself. Right. So, um, so I, but Merrimack was an incredibly invaluable experience for me because it, it gave me an insight into all the aspects of the business, mm -hmm. right? It, you know, how do you, how do you manage all these different things going on? How do you understand all the different aspects of college athletics, which I think is important because, you know, if you're in any leadership position, 
you have to be able to understand what your folks are are doing. Right. The folks who are under your leadership, you have to understand their jobs. You may not be the expert in their jobs, right? I mean, I'm I'm not a compliance expert. I'm just not. I'm sure Karen Helderman is probably going to wince if she hears this story. But <laughs> uh, this, I mean, this podcast. But I'm not a compliance expert. But I I certainly understand what what it goes into it. I think, though, you know, to have uh, some understanding of what your folks are doing and, and the challenges of their jobs is, is really important from a leadership perspective. And those five years at Merrimack were, were incredibly formative for me. So after Merrimack, I went to American University in D.C. Uh, mm-hmm. I was there for six years. For the first three years, I was uh, doing facilities and operations again and, and oversaw the, the swimming, diving and soccer programs. And then uh, and then after that, I got transitioned over to fundraising. So um, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those, it's funny how things happen to you in life. So, um, we had, uh, we had an athletic director transition and I was the, the interim AD there for, for a bit. And, um, the, the, the vice president who oversaw athletics was actually the vice president for uh, development alumni relations a guy named Al Cecchio, who's, um, Al, I think is still at uh, USC out in LA as, as the uh, VP for development there. He said to me, you know, and I was probably, I don't know, 29 at the time, maybe 30. He said, you know, you, you're never going to be an AD going from being a facilities person. You need to, to widen your, your your portfolio. And I said, well, okay, how, how do I do that? He said, well, you, you know, we, and we didn't have an athletic fundraiser at the time. And, uh, it, it, and, and really had no annual fund or anything like that. He said, well, you know, why don't you, um, why don't we do this? You know, we need a person to raise money. You know, you got a good personality. Why don't you, uh, why don't you, you know, try your hand in development? I said, well, you know, what do I have to do? I really didn't kind of understand it, right? He said, well, it's not really that hard. You meet people, you send some letters out. It's really not that difficult. It turns out, Jay, it's incredibly difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly difficult. But I, I really, I, I thank Al for that because if, if he didn't push me to do that and and, and I didn't have that, that experience of raising money and, and, and doing all that external stuff, I, I would never be where I was uh, there and, and I would never be where I am today. So um, after doing that at, uh, at AU for the last three years and raising money, I, uh, I got the athletic director job at Niagara University. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was at Niagara for six years. We had an incredible amount of success. We won more championships in my six years at Niagara than uh, the, the school won in the 75 years in, in division one before that or, or since, um, you know, total. So we had an incredible amount of success there. Um, but, but certainly, uh, the, the nice thing is that Niagara was a place where as a young AD, I was only 33 years old when I got the job. I was, I think it was the youngest AD in the country at that time. Um, you know, it, it Niagara gave me a place where I could learn, uh, from a leadership perspective, I could make some mistakes, uh, and it wasn't going to cost me my career. Um, I wasn't going to, you know, burn the building down by any stretch of the imagination, but I could also feel my way through things and learn how to be a lot, a lot more patient, a lot better of a listener, a lot um, more thoughtful in terms of all the, the things you need to do f- as a leader. So, you know, th- those things really helped get me ready for the opportunity I got here in 2012. And, and uh, certainly the, 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 the most uh, impactful in, in, uh, in, in, uh, formative last 10 years of my life have been spent or nine years of my life have been spent here at BCU. So talk about that over the last nine years, lots of changes in general in collegiate athletics, but uh, dramatic changes in just the operation and then the success of the VCU team. So talk about that, the change in athletics in general, and then what you have seen at VCU over the last nine years. Yeah, it's funny. Like you know, when I got to VCU, we had just um, we had literally had just moved from in being the Colonial to the Atlantic Ten, and, and certainly um, in, a, in an incredible time of transition for us as well as as a department and as a uh, as as a men's basketball program. You know, obviously the year before the team had gone to the Final Four, and and right before I got here. Uh, won the, the CAA as well in, uh, in 2012 and advancing the NSA tournament and played and won a game. Uh, you know, and, and I got here at a time when <clears throat> obviously, you know, the popularity of our basketball program had just skyrocketed. I mean, you know, it's um, the year before in 2011 when we went to the Final Four, uh, you know, 
VCU searches on Google broke Google. I mean, it was like one of those that either the internet exploded when uh, people wanted to lo learn about VCU. But, you know, I got here at a time when all that conference realignment was happening and, and right. business just changed so drastically and schools were going all over heaven's half acre to play games because of television contracts and, and all these things. So, you know, I, I got here at a time that it was tremendous, tremendous upheaval in, in college athletics. And now, as you've seen, the, the business continues to change so drastically. Right now, it's obviously the, the big piece uh, that's being discussed a lot is, is name, image, and likeness and how the student athletes will be eventually able to uh, earn some some type of revenue uh, off their own name, image, and likeness in, in a wide variety of ways. That's still being not only sorted out by the NSA, but uh, but at the state and federal level, uh, governmentally as well. So, um, but, you know, we are in a, in a time of tremendous change. The, 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 the way that folks who grew up watching college basketball for the last 40, 50 years, it, it's changed the last 10 years quite a bit, um, you know, in, in terms of, of how, you know, the one and done things happened. You know, we've seen stuff with the FBI case that, that in, in terms of trying to um, clean up recruiting. Uh, so it, it's, it's been a tremendous change. But, you know, I, when I look at VCU, it, it's, it's really, you know, we've changed so much in the last little bit here because you know, we've had some coaching changes, but we've just, we've elevated the profile of the university and also been able to shed so much light on all the other really amazing things that happen at the university. Um, but yeah, I mean, I will say this, you know, when you come in and um, you, you work with a, a program and certainly at that time, our, our men's basketball coach, Coach Smart, you know, when you work with a guy like that at, at that time, not only his intelligence, his energy was, was great, um, but it was like, it was like being around one of the Beatles, uh, you know, in a lot of ways. I mean, there aren't a lot of people who go by one name, right? And everyone knows who Shock is. And, and, you know, I mean, but it was, you know, not only our community, but we, we were in New York airport in LaGuardia one time and, uh, it was at, right after media day and a couple of random people came over, Hey, listen, Shock, uh, it's, it's great to see you and, you know, uh, really root for you guys. And, this, that. and just not VCU alums, just randoms, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's in it, it, his, his popularity just continue to grow. Um, but at that same time, he always made it about our, our student athletes and our, our program continue to grow. Uh, so, and, and I, I would say this, I mean, I think the most important thing that we did at that, at that time is not um, the most important thing we, we, we continued the, the trajectory of our program and we validated the final four by continuing to win and not falling off and not having a bad year um, in, in those few years, as soon as we got in the A-10, continuing to go back to the NSA tournament, winning the championship in 2015, um, even through coaching transitions, you know, getting now to, to Mike as our, our, as our coach who's done a terrific job. Um, you know, we've been able to validate our success by continuing to win. And that's been, transformative for our department. Um, it really has been. We, we, we obviously opened the Basketball Development Center in 2015. Um, and that was a huge, huge thing. I mean, it, it, there, are, there aren't five, I mean, I, I'd say there aren't five buildings in the country that are as nice as that is still six years later. It'll be six years in November that we opened it. Um, you know, Without a doubt, it's a beautiful facility. It's beautiful, it really is. And, and our student athletes are there all the time. I, to me, the bricks and mortar are great, but the, the way it gives our student athletes and those programs a, a, a place to hang out with each other, a place to be, a place to call home, um, it, it's really, you know, it, it, that's, that's what, worth its weight in gold. What, what the bricks and mortar are tremendous in the technology inside of it. It's incredible in how we can, you know, how we can help our student athletes get better and work on their games just with that technology. Um, it's, it's incredible. Um, all the film stuff we can do with it. But the connectivity our teams have is, is really what's special. And I think if you watch us play, our, our teams genuinely like playing together. They know that they, they like being on the same team, uh, which is not, not common <laughs> across college <laughs> athletics. You, you know, you see it all the time, but, uh, but our teams really like playing together. And, and I think that's, to me, that's worth its weight in gold in, in terms of what we've done with the BDC. 
So that's a, a, a great point of what's next for the teams. You know, there's a lot of talk about the athletic village and yep. what we're going to be able to do for VC, VCU athletics going forward. But then also what do fans have uh, to look forward to in the coming years? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the athletic village because that's obviously a really important piece, right? Um, you know, as transformative as the BDC has been and, and even the Siegel Center when we opened it 20 plus years ago, um, as, as transformative as that has been, you know, we, we don't have facilities for our other sports. Our, our, our soccer teams, which are NCAA caliber teams and, and our men's team has been to the NCAA tournament a bunch, you know, we don't have our own practice fields which is amazing. Our, our baseball team, which went to the super regionals in, in 2015 has won some eight, 10 championships. Um, you know, we don't have our own clubhouse in, at, at the ballpark of the diamond. I mean, the diamond is probably the most antiquated uh, facility you've, you, you can come across in, in all sports right now. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we don't even have our own place to our own clubhouse for a place to go or, you know, our, our student athletes have to, um, get changed over here and head over, you know, and, and it's just the little things like that. I, the, the one I really tell all the time is our indoor track team, our women's indoor track team has won three of the last five, eight, 10 championships without an indoor track. So <laughs> we either run outside on the outdoor track. If it gets too cold, we run on the concourse of the Siegel center, which if anyone who's a runner knows running on straight concrete is not good for your feet, it's not, not good for your feet or your shins or your legs, whatever. So it's, it's amazing what our student athletes have been able to do with, and certainly our coaches as well, without having those facilities. And as incredible as the Siegel Center is for our basketball programs and volleyball, you know, our Olympic sports and all the other sports, we just lack, we, we lack those facilities. So the Athletic Village is gonna be incredible, you know, uh, an indoor outdoor tennis facility uh, with six indoor courts and 12 outdoor courts, uh, new soccer stadium, new track, um, practice fields for our soccer teams and in an in, in indoor facility with an indoor track as well um an indoor, indoor turf surface so i mean it's just transformative facilities that will take us from being um, a really good basketball national elite basketball programs with olympic sports that win championships to top 25 programs across the board and that's really what we can be uh, as in, in terms of the next 10 years for VCU athletics and where, and where we go for our fans. I mean, you know, I think our fans can just look forward to being back in the Siegel center and being, you know, being able to come watch us play games and all these things, but you know, it's going to really be a thing where these facilities being open 250, 300 days a year, um, in, in a wide variety of ways, open up to the community, um, I think what it does is it gives us a much bigger lens that people can see VCU athletics and give us a whole lot more fans that, that may not be associated with us right now, but you might be a fan of tennis in the community and, and uh, you know, we built this new facility, you may become a VCU tennis fan after that, right? Uh, so I think this really opens up the possibility for us to have a whole bunch of folks who may not be involved with us right now to get involved with us as we go forward. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us something about your role that might surprise people um, that you're responsible for? I think, you know, it, it, you understand it better than anyone, Jay, because you, you live it as well. I mean, you know, the other duties as assigned portion of uh, our job responsibilities are are tremendous. I mean, I, I think I've, I've uh, the, the amount I've spent the last five years doing uh, some level of uh, commercial real estate development and <laughs> uh, political lobbying, um, I, I think pe that would surprise people. And it's, it's certainly a little unique um, given our circumstances and, and the need for land, right? So as an urban institution, we are incredibly landlocked and you know, to enable to, in, in order to build the athletic village, you know, we, we've had to, piece together 40 acres of land through a bunch of different parcels. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, you know, I, I've relied on my, my good friends in, in VCU government relations to help coach me along a little bit and, and, uh, and, and all that uh, in meetings with legislators and, and uh, local uh, elected officials. But, you know, that piece of it, the, 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 um, the, the stuff that's outside of hiring coaches and raising money and, and dealing with our student athletes, that's been a lot. I mean, it's, it's been a lot of work. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, from the land acquisition perspective, from 
dealing with community groups. Um, you know, when, when we built the, the BDC, I went to the, the Carver Association community group. Um, I went to their, I went to 20 of their meetings to, in order for them to feel good about us building the BDC, which is great. They're really, really nice people. Um, but, uh, you know, th that, that uh, deal with the politics part of it and the, the local politics certainly uh, at the state and local level has been something people probably wouldn't anticipate, but it's taken a, quite a bit of time. I, I've told Matt and, and Kara in government relations that I will um, I will turn in my recreational lobbyist um, degree. Uh, that I'm, I'm done with that that uh, that piece of it as we go forward after this. I, you 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 know it is funny. You, in the last five years, I just think about all of those uh, special meetings that you've been involved in, and then the uh, reports to both the cabinet and then the board of visitors that you've um, you've completed. <clears throat> Truly, other duties as assigned. Truly, I mean, hey, let's—we all have it, Jay. You know that. It's all stuff we do as, as part of working in university leadership. And you're like, wow, I, I didn't didn't see that one coming today. Uh, but uh, but you know, hey, listen, I think anything that that we can that we can do collectively to to move VCU ahead and, and make us better as a uh, as a university, we're all willing to do it. Uh, so it's just a question of. Doing a little bit of learning and, and listening to the folks who, who are experts in the area to, to really help guide it. Absolutely. So this might be a little unfair when you have so many different um, uh, programs that have excelled so much, but is there a one particular moment or memory that you have uh, during the last nine years that's really meaningful to you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I I thought about this a lot. Like, you know, how do we uh, how do you sort of put it in, in into one? Uh, one special thing, you know, to me, I think it is, there's probably a couple of funny ones. I, I will say, you know, I, I was, um, I was in Barcelona with the team uh, in 2016 on our foreign trip when, when Doug Brooks bought the, uh, I was actually with him when he bought the infamous uh, white Russian general's hat that he wore in, uh, in the press conference a few years ago and, and uh, sparked a, a crazed by our fans to buy a bunch of white Russian general hats. Um, and I was also the one who encouraged him to wear it to the press conference that night. And um, Coach Wade, our basketball coach at the time, was not so thrilled with me uh, when I encouraged Doug to do it. Um, but uh, so th that was certainly a funny moment, a certain, but um, but from, from the rewarding part of it, uh, just seeing uh, our student athletes graduate and seeing our student athletes um, who, who've overcome so many obstacles in life to, to get to where they are. Uh, that to me is, has, has been the best moment if you want to kind of put it collectively that way. Um, you know, seeing, uh, I mean, just the, the hundreds of student athletes that we've had come through, um, but, but so proud of them. You know, Saeed Haji from uh, men's soccer who hasn't graduated yet is, is on track to finish. Um, he's playing professional soccer now, but um, just an incredible story and he got drafted number two uh, in the MLS draft but just an incredible story of walking across uh, walking across Kenya as a kid to, to escape um, just the, the political unrest there in the Civil War and, uh, or a guy like Mo Ali Cox who you know was was a partial qualifier his, his freshman year ends up leaving with uh, with three VCU degrees and uh, now he's playing a sport he didn't even play in college at the professional level. And, and Mo just signed a, a, a really terrific contract as well. Um, so I'm happy for him. And I talked to him the other day in, um, when we were in Indianapolis, because uh, obviously he plays there with the Colts, right? So, um, you know, just those, those stories of our, our student athletes who have graduated and, and done really well for themselves. And, or even someone like David Hinton, you know, who, who was a walk-on on, on, uh, on the Final Four team and graduated. Uh, in 2013 with his master's degree in 12 for his undergraduate in 2013 with his master's degree and now his, his terrific job with the secret service and is on uh is on the president's detail um and david's i mean terrific doing a, a great job there so you know there's so many of those stories that our student athletes have have sort of um not only done a great job with us but they've continued to to do after you know to me that has been fantastic. And the, the amount that they still want to be a part of VCU, that to me is, is, is the special part of it. It is remarkable to see how many of the former athletes across all sports uh, continue to come back to the university, engage with the departments that they, that they graduated from. 
but then yep. also uh, stay in contact with the teams. It's it really is remarkable. It really is, and you think about it too, Jay. I mean, it's you know we have we have kids who come from all over the place, but they make Richmond their home because right. it was really home to them. You know, the the number of of student athletes like Jaquan Lewis, who's from Dixon, Tennessee, this really small town right outside of Nashville in Tennessee, and and when 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 Jaquan's not playing professional basketball overseas, you know, he he spends his time in Richmond and and. Uh, you know, he, he said he was here this summer and uh, was over the house this, this summer uh, for uh, for dinner one night and, and just said, you know, this is home to me, man. This is this is where, uh, you know, when I'm done, I'm going to I want to live here that, you know, that's that just tells you what VCU has, has meant in this community has meant to folks are not only just our fans, but embracing it. But what a great place Richmond is to live and and and, uh, and, and how much the university just really impacts the city. I, I couldn't agree more. And it is it is remarkable when you think about just across the board, how many students we recruit from all over the country and then make Richmond their home. So and, 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 and from all over the world, too, and, and the number of soccer players that we've had uh, come through here from all different places who who call this place home now. And I, I've seen them all coaching against my kids in, in club soccer. So, I mean, I we stay connected <laughs> with them, but. Uh, but it's it's terrific. It really is, and it just it just shows you the opportunity that VCU gives people. Now, your role is much more public than most in the leadership um, uh, positions, and so I think people have a general feeling that they know you well. But well, I love to end these by saying, "Tell us something about yourself that might surprise people." So, what is something that people might not know about you? Uh, well, number one, I'm I'm colorblind. Uh, so, um, if, if, you know, if I don't have help, uh, getting dressed in the morning, um, I can probably put together some, some interesting combinations of things. So yeah, I, uh, that, and, uh, and I also, I, um, I'm ambidextrous as well. So that's the, those are the other couple things. Now I'm one of those weird ambidextrous people that I do certain things only with one hand too. It's like, I only eat with one hand. Um, I, I, I play, you know, sports different ways of different sports with with different hands so i'm kind of a little odd that way but um but yeah i, I do a whole bunch of different things um ambidextrous so that those are probably the two things about me uh that that people would say now i i guess if you if you um saw how i dress sometimes you probably could figure out that i'm colorblind but but that's okay too usually with black and gold it's good because you know it's pretty neutral colors i as long as I know it's 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 uh, VCU stuff, if I wear gear all the time, it's usually pretty good for me. I love that. Well, Ed, thanks so much for spending time with us today. I know you're really busy and really appreciate you sharing your time with us. Well, I appreciate it very much, my friend, and uh, it's you know I, I appreciate the, the the partnership that that we have with with Development Alumni Relations. Y'all have been terrific partners, and I look forward to it growing even more. 